Hey guys, I hope you're doing good. Just going to be jumping right back into the Word, right back into Matthew. I kind of have to do stuff a little bit different today. I, I'm at a relative's house, a family's house, kind of just watching over their house for them. So I decided to bring you guys with me. Why not? It's awesome. I love I love the Word of God. I had some time with myself, time today. I'll have some more time tonight. But yeah, I just want to jump back into the Word. So I don't actually have um, this set up how I normally do, but that's okay because... I can screen share and this is eventually what I kind of want to do in the future I know when I open it up um, certain nights it won't be all the time but where we can just study for a little bit and just be together and where I can you know do videos and, and just screen share and you have the Word of God right here so I actually have like my my notebook and stuff that I've kind of been taking notes because I normally just go straight off of my phone and straight off the word I have the actual um, paperback and like hard copies of the word of God it's just a little bit easier to share and uh, so yeah we'll just make do and uh, I just wanted to finish up Matthew chapter 12 where we were at and just the other day and we see Christ we see Christ actually talking to these Pharisees and giving them warning saying you know you you speak word against me it'll be forgiven of you we're, we're seeing Christ here highlight being fully man but fully God as well. You go after the deity part of him. You go after the Holy Spirit, that which he stands for, the truth. You're going after God himself. So it's Christ humbling himself, but also showing his, his uh, fully man, fully God. And he's addressing the uh, religious uh, leaders here. You see, brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? So let's just jump right back in where we had finished off uh, verse 38. It says, then some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. And that sounds familiar, too. Notice how these aren't these aren't the people. Like, even if there were Jewish people or Gentiles, everybody who was healed throughout uh, the, uh, this New Testament that we see where Christ walked, they either humbled themselves. We see the lady who had a blood flow issue. It was by faith. It was all by faith, and it was all by humbling. Or they just didn't even ask. Uh... Just like I, I was reading the account the other day, it's so amazing of the the two pools that they have where a lot of the lame, a lot of the lepers, a lot of those who are sick are washed because the angel goes down and stirs up the water and the very first person that steps into the water gets healed and we, we know that the account is there's a, a, a paralyzed man. You know, somebody always steps over him and he doesn't have anybody to bring in the water. So christ goes and he finds uh his people and, and and they humble themselves you know they don't we see we see the characteristics coming from these religious pharisees they've seen everything they've seen the teaching they've seen people healed that you know they, they say no no man has ever taught like this no man has ever spoke like this and they want to see a sign from him that's the thing they want to see a sign that the, there's no faith they're looking just to entrap him god already knows their thoughts their intents that's why we'll see the context and in getting into it but notice the characteristics too from like the gentiles and even those who are uh being jews that are healed i mean even the uh roman centurion who came and humbled himself lord just say the word we see the difference we see those who truly humble themselves those who go to christ have true faith but also those who christ specifically picks out and finds because he finds his sheep. He goes to the lost sheep of the house of Israel first. Then it gets over to the Gentiles. So he says, I was sent specifically to the lost sheep of the house of Israel for this moment in time. But it was all by God's plan, God's divine purpose for it to go to the Gentiles as well. Remember Paul says, you know, hey, if it wasn't for the Jewish people rejecting it, you guys wouldn't have been saved. But he said, nevertheless, it's all happened by God's will, God's plan. God wanted the Gentiles and this is another thing we're going to see too, kind of just uh, the, the Jewish religious leaders, these Pharisees, these scribes, they, they, knew, uh, they knew the law. And they knew, they knew Moses, they knew the Torah, they knew the Tanakh. Now, they might not have truly believed in it, they might not have truly understood it, but they definitely knew, uh, they definitely knew the law. And they definitely knew what has been given to them uh, through Father Abraham, down with Moses. So... 
but it's it's these guys it's these guys right here that that know the scriptures can line it up should be able to look directly at christ and say wow this is the messiah but what do they do teacher we want to see a sign from you because they're going to try and entrap him but highlight here these religious scribes and these pharisees they're jewish they're the ones who want to see the signs because it's the signs that's been given to them just like in uh when we see in acts acts chapter 2 when the holy spirit comes down upon his disciples and they start speaking in tongues and there's 16 different tribes there and their actual languages their actual languages from these different tribes because it was for that specific moment in time just like these jewish religious and and uh uh leaders and um scribes they 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 fully you know, are just trying to entrap Christ, fully trying to trick him. They've seen what he's done before. They've seen what he's tested. And they just want to see, not necessarily more of a sign, like, oh yeah, give us more and more of a sign, but just to trap him. So it's just like when um, Christ healed on the Sabbath. Instead of praising God, wow, you know, let alone the Messiahs here themselves because of, of jealousy, envy, greed, it, let alone just praising God, wow, this man who's been in bondage, who's been... Uh, who's been um, entrapped by uh, leprosy, by um, uncleanliness, by uh, paralytic, whatever. Instead of praising God, they just, they, they get uh, jealous, they get envious, and they just look to entrap them more. Now, another thing I want you guys to notice too from, uh, from the Gentiles, um, for even those who are sick, but, but when it branches off, which we will get there eventually, notice how these Jewish people, uh, these scribes, these Pharisees, these religious leaders, they want a sign. They want a sign. Give us a sign. Give us a sign. Give us a sign. And and they did get signs. If they would have actually paid attention, if they would have actually known and believed in the actual scriptures, they would have had the sign. They would have had the Lord Jesus Christ himself, God himself, coming. Everything the Old Testament prophesied about, written about, is standing right in front of them. And they just want to see a sign just to entrap him just to trick him but take a look at the gentiles too. take it from the uh, roman centurion from um even you know we can tie it in with just a couple a couple of jewish people but but what i'm trying to say here is is look at the when you tie it in from the pharisees from the religious leaders those who are high ranking with the law of moses when it comes to jews they 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 want signs and they want to and trap when you, but when you compare it to Gentiles, when you compare it to the Jewish people who are broken, those who have been sick, those who have been in bondage uh, by leprosy, by paralytic, they humble themselves. They have faith, just like that that lady, uh, just like the the man with the withered hand, or, or the the man who's sitting by the pool of uh, Bethsaida, the the two pools that wash he's been he, there for 38 years not there for 38 years he had a, a an issue for 38 years but it was oh why did you do this so oh, i want to see a sign when christ came to him he's you know it's humble i don't have anybody to 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 put me in here it was faith it was believing so even after all that time even being broken being torn being in bondage being sick being walked over they after 38 years after all this time even the lady with the blood flow problem from multiple years still humble still believe just by belief because they don't need signs they have belief they understand how wicked they are they understand how broken they are they understand how, how nothing they are they understand that they need the lord jesus christ then when the lord jesus christ comes boom they do everything they can to get to him they put everything aside and have faith if i could just get to him if i just believe now regardless if, if we're just talking about the man who was sitting there at the pool or the man uh the man who was healed on the sabbath they didn't really know because christ came to them but it was those who had gotten word the lady with the blood flow problem the roman centurion the the four uh boys carrying their friend down on the on the into the house where christ is it was by faith you knock everything else aside you knock works aside you knock the religion aside you knock the race aside you knock the law aside they believed they knew that they could get the lord jesus christ because this is god himself come so it's just amazing we just kind of see um we see the characteristics kind of and how nothing's really changed is is the scriptures you know god never changes he warns us and, and, and just to kind of get an idea, it says, okay, so some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered saying, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after signs. 
and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now the context obviously is right here in this moment in time, but even if we want to transfer it and have it to today's, man, look at all the signs we have. People can say, oh yeah, I want to see God. I won't believe unless I see him, man. It's crazy. You see the spirit of God alive at work throughout people, left and right, different religions, different beliefs, bringing people to Christ. No other religion can bring people from various religions to them. It's not my truth. They'll try and say, oh yeah, well, you know, uh, all these other fake false religions, I'm not going to highlight one specific. They'll say, oh yeah, people are coming left and right. Well, because it's, it's what can be done to them. It's because they're being forced. They have guns put to their head. But it's only by the blood of Christ, it's only Christ that's being able to take these people out of these different religions and bring them to the truth, to the knowledge, and have them being free in their heart. See, it's not just an outward appearance of a different religion, it's a completely different change of heart. Only, uh, only God can do that, you know, and he did that through Christ, through his son. God in the flesh. It says, okay, so this, an evil and adulterous generation, and we know that we're living in one of the worst times just like the days of noah but look at the signs that we have so look at the look at the attack of these pharisees and these scribes let alone they have the messiah standing right there with them everything that he had done the prophecies being fulfilled and they're still looking for a sign because it was just by that physical eyes they weren't seeing it spiritual they weren't understanding by the heart if they had the right their heart uh, right with God. If they had faith and they could uh, had eyes to see, they would they would have no problem. But they want to see with their physical eyes, just like this world wants to see with their physical eyes. The difference is this world has no excuse. You can see it with the physical eyes. You can see what's right around the corner. Everything the word is prophesied about. You can go back to the standard. Uh, evidence that we have for everything lot's wife a pillar of salt still there today chariot wheels at the bottom of the red sea the rock that moses still split the exact spot that the bible says the ark landed in turkey still there today and that's just the old testament jericho being found fire and brimstone uh in sodom and gomorrah the end time signs uh, every day that we have, we wake up, we have the visual evidence, life itself. So they're, they're without excuse. But I want you to understand too, these religious scribes and Pharisees, it can almost be kind of tied in today, only it's kind of worse today. Because with these scribes and these Pharisees, they, they should know better. Obviously, them, them being Christ pointing out their hypocrisy, them trying to entrap the Son of God. And he's, you know, he's trying, showing them that you know, if you had eyes to see, if you truly believe, you, would, you would, wouldn't need a sign. Because the sign's already here. And it's just like today, but they're reprobate. They're reprobate just like uh, these Pharisees. They don't want to believe. So it doesn't necessarily have to be. You just see what Christ does. You see the difference between the truth and, and then blinding truth. The difference between truth and deception. And, and how it, it's just a reprobate. They just don't want to. They don't want to see it. They don't want to believe it. There's no excuse. Now granted, we can say, you know, God hasn't given them eyes to see. This is that the lie that. It's all by the will of God. He makes them believe a lie because of their hearts. It's because of the heart. But they're without excuse because life itself, all the signs that we have today is different than the signs that they had had right here. See, now right here, obviously they're without excuse because they had the Son of God standing right in front of them. But it's just like today. They're without excuse. We're without excuse. You want signs, you have signs. It's how you want to look at it. It's how we want to look at it. See, these Pharisees wanted to look at it through their eyes, through their physical eyes, not by their heart, not by their spiritual eyes, not by what was God given. You do it this way. Give us a sign. I want to see this. Instead of what has already been given to us, look at life itself. Look at the end time signs. Look at the mark that's right around the corner. I mean... They, they pick and choose, but it's all because of the heart. And he says, And an evil, adulterous generation seeks after a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. It says, For Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish. So will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And they would have understood this if they would have believed. They would have known the scriptures. But it's just like with Jonah. Jonah being cast out of the, the mouth of the fish alive. Christ coming out of the belly of the earth alive. Now this right here goes to show us that the, the hell is in the earth, in the center of the earth. And we know that obviously from what Christ has said, but from 
we have evidence too and that's what's amazing is we can take the evidence we we go off of the word of god to begin with so the word of god stands because it's proven itself it always proves itself time and time again what we have in the world and what happens in the world just continues to confirm it so it's just like a the group of uh i believe it was russian here i'll let you guys take a look you get it take a look at this sometimes when you guys get a chance We'll do this. Actually, you know what? Let's just do it right here. Check this out. It's the Siberian hellhole. What happened was these group of miners, they dig, they they dug the uh, largest hole. Yeah, okay. To in the earth known today, and it's the Siberian scream. They picked up the screams of the damned. What they did is they, they put a microphone all the way down into this hole and it got so hot that it melted, but they picked up a little bit of the screams of the damned and you can literally hear hell and it scared them so much that they stopped working and it's still left today and people try and deny this. Oh yeah, it's fake. It's not fake. This is for real. They for real, real picked up the screams of the damned. Listen to this. Don't book a cheap hotel. Expensive hotel for cheap on hot wire. Nice. Oh, it's got pockets. The story about the digging, the hearing of the sounds from hell is very real. It did occur in Siberia. My uncle collected video and so forth on the paranormal, supernatural. He passed away fairly recently, but he would have loved your show. He let me listen to one of the audio tapes that he had on the sounds from hell in Siberia, and I copied it. He received his copy from a friend who worked at the BBC. It took me a while to find it tonight, but attached is that sound from my uncle's tapes. It's not the greatest quality, but the sounds are there. I was very hesitant to send you this as the sound bothers me to listen to. I'd suggest that if you do play it on the program, warn listeners in advance so they may have the option of turning the radio off for 30 seconds while it plays. It has always haunted me. To those who discounted the Siberia sounds from Hell's story, it is true, and I, for one, wish it wasn't. Rick, listening from Chicago. And so I submit now the clean, uh, a better copy to you. And uh, I warn you, what you are about to hear is very disturbing indeed. just a you know just an idea and then it's this scared them so much that they stopped and it's still there today and you can find this um on dixie Hetty's uh youtube channel so yeah so what we do is just amazing we have the evidence and things like this in the world this will continue to happen and then we just you know it, it just confirms the word of god that's what it is so it's just amazing so it says Now, understand, too, it was Jonah being consumed by the fish and was spit out alive. But the difference with the difference with Christ is he took on the sins of the world, which we know Romans 6.23 for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of, of life get of God is eternal salvation through Jesus Christ because God put himself into a system of flesh into a world of flesh because God can't die God can't feel pain he can't be tempted but putting himself into a, uh, the the flesh he's able to so that's the difference is 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 it when we compare Christ and even compare cuz Christ comparing himself here to the difference is when Christ went down into the the belly of the of the earth into hell snatched the keys out you know he didn't stay there he didn't burn 
Because when he says to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise, how can he be in paradise if he's in hell? He went down to hell, snatched the keys. Now he has the keys to both heaven and hell because what had happened is, is God gave Adam those keys and then Adam gave them over to Satan. So Christ, being the second Adam, came and, and snatched those keys back and now he has the keys to heaven and hell. He could have done it however he wanted. He did it by God's will, by God's way, by, by rule, by order because that's who God is. God is pure love and everything's done out of out of order out of justice, out of righteousness. And uh, so we see but what Christ, the difference with Christ is he took that death. He took that pain. He took that sin. He took that wrath and yet he still overcame it because he is life. Obviously, not comparing and not getting into that necessarily. But the difference with Christ going into the center of the earth, just like Jonah going into the center of a fish, Jonah being spit out alive, so also Christ being... Uh, being raised alive. The difference is Christ obviously taking the sin, taking the shame, taking the condemnation and the wrath of God for all of our sins. Because this is where he gets into it. So, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So we know hell to be right in the heart of the earth. It says, For the men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. Because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed greater than Jonah is here. And, and that's the difference, is because when they received a sign, they repented. Christ already knows their heart. Those They weren't asking for a sign. And, and when, when these Jewish leaders and these uh, Pharisees asked for a sign, Christ already knew that they weren't going to believe. The difference is the men of Nineveh believed and they repented. Now that Christ is here, someone greater than Jonah, someone greater than all prophets, than anybody, yet they're still, if even if they were to receive a sign, they weren't going to believe because of their heart. So in doing so, it's reaping what you sow, having it come back to you. The men of Nineveh who repented and believed on that sign is going to stand. It's going to come back to you on judgment because Christ is standing there in front of you. You being uh, Pharisees and scribes who know the Old Testament, know the law, uh, have no excuse. That's going to come back even greater. That's just kind of like, you know, and it's obviously an argument, but it's like every day that goes on, as more time goes by, I feel like the judgment is just going to kind of get worse and worse. Like there's no excuse. Like the time that we're living in, man, you have life itself. You have all the standard evidence. You have the prophecy coming to play. Like it, it's just getting, it's going to be worse and worse for them, I believe. They're going to have, they have all these signs that has been given to them without asking and yet they still don't repent. That's the difference with the, the men of Nineveh is they had these signs. They had the sign and they repented. Christ knows their heart. It's just like Lazarus. You know, hey, the rich man, let, you know, let me go out and warn people. Well, no, because... You know, if they're not going to listen to the prophets, um, if they don't, not going to listen to the prophets that God gave, they're not definitely not going to listen to you. And that's crazy. That's crazy to think that someone would raise from the dead. So, you know, we need to repent. We need to repent. They still wouldn't do it. But it's all by the hearts. It's by their hearts. And that's why the majority of the signs won't happen today is because look at all the signs we have. Look at what's been given. And yet they still won't repent and believe. I mean, it, it's becoming more and more clear even just physically, like before, if you didn't have eyes to see, that's one thing. But now physically, it's like so obvious and yet they're still choosing not to. Why would a sign be given to them? It's just like Christ is saying here, your hearts are so wicked. Even if you get the sign, you're not going to believe. I mean, if you had spiritual eyes to see, you would be able to see the times, the signs of the end. Just like if they had spiritual eyes to see, they would have been able to see the Son of God. So... And, and that's the key to they repented. It's it's repentance. It's there's there's pride there. There's no repentance. It says the queen of the south will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear wisdom of Solomon, and indeed greater than Solomon is here. So look at what Christ is re, is doing. He's also referring to scriptures to text that they would know. You want a sign? Technically, he's given them a sign. They wanted signs with physical eyes, but he, he's not giving them a sign with physical eyes. He's actually giving them a sign spiritually. He's referring to the scriptures that he wrote. It's God's word, but what they knew. The prophet Jonah, 
the queen of the south with Solomon. They knew exactly what he was talking about, yet they chose not to. They were they were thinking with their phys they were thinking with their wicked hearts, trying to see through their physical eyes in the flesh instead of the spirit, which came from God. Now, real quick, let's go to Kings actually. So I believe this is I believe this is where it's at. It says in 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 1, it says, Now when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. Does that sound familiar? This is what Christ is referring to. It says she came to Jerusalem with, the, with very great retinue, with camel and bore spices, very much gold, precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. So Solomon answered her, answered all her questions. There was nothing so difficult for the king that he could not explain it to her. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon and the house that he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his servants, the service of his waiters, and their apparel, his cupbearers, and his entryway by which he went up by the house of the Lord, there was no, no more spirit in her. Then she said to the king, It was a true report which I heard from my own land about the words of your wisdom. However, I did not believe the words until I came and saw with my own eyes. That's what he's referring to, the physical eyes. You wouldn't have believed unless you actually saw with your own eyes. Just like what he said to Thomas. Everything that Thomas had seen and been through. No, 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 no. What Christ had pruned time and time again. What he had said. What the disciples had said. Nope. I, I will not do it unless I see it with my own physical eyes. And then Christ, you know, Thomas, put your finger, put your hand right here on my side. My Lord and my God, you know, Thomas, because you have seen, you have believed. But blessed are those who have yet not seen but still believed, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It says, a true report. Okay. However, I did not believe until I had come and saw with my own eyes. So faith, 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 faith. It says, indeed, and indeed half was not told to me, your wisdom, your prosperity exceeded the fame which I heard. So understand too that even though she needed to see it with her, excuse me, even though she needed to see it with her own eyes, she's the queen of the south. When she had finally seen it, she was, wow. You know, she was in shock. She was in awe. But it had been given to her. She had seen it with her physical eyes. Just like if we go to these uh, religious scribes and Pharisees, nothing that God would have done would have made them change their mind because it's their heart. There's a reason Christ didn't do it. There's a reason it happened like this because Christ knew their heart. And that's the difference. It's not by faith. It's not by the physical eyes. So, indeed, a greater, jo greater than Jonah is here. And she even offered him stuff, you know, brought him stuff. Now Solomon, wisest man, all the riches, everything, and yet she offered him more of what he already had. It says, so they repented. Okay, someone greater than than Solomon, because where Solomon had got all his wisdom, where where Solomon had been put up, the creator of Solomon is here. One is greater. But you see what Christ is doing. Christ is, is using it to where that they would understand. They asked for a sign. They want a sign with the physical eyes. Well, they didn't get a sign with the physical eyes. They got one with the spiritual eyes. They just couldn't see it. So it says the queen of the south will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it. So notice how he's using his scriptures because it's, it's God breathed. It's from Christ himself. But what they used, they studied. He's using what they know to show them how they're going to be condemned. The same truth that you stand on, the same truth that you preach, the same truth that you claim to know is going to be the same truth that comes back and condemns you. Because you're too focused on the physical eyes. There's still an issue at heart. You're not truly understanding. You don't truly belong to God. You don't truly believe. It's all by belief, belief, belief. It's all by faith, trust. Not by that physical, not by that flesh, which we see this the, the dividing here. It says, okay, so now he gets into it. He kind of just goes off, off course here. He says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, 
He goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house in which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empties and sweeps and put in order. And this is kind of where I see Christ. The way they're asking for a sign through the physical eyes, he'd given them a sign spiritually. Now, the reason I think he kind of jumped off here just to continue on course, but also to show them, to show us believers, to show his disciples, to show everybody that they would understand if they had spiritual eyes. If they truly had faith, he's going to show them right here how they don't understand because the way he uses house, they're thinking physical buildings. They're thinking, they're thinking in the flesh. But what Christ is doing is he's referring to how they're thinking. He's referring to the scriptures. He's referring to the one who wrote it himself, Christ, and showing how it's now by him, the house of the body. is that new covenant, that new testament by his blood. How it's changed by faith and faith alone. But yet they don't understand that because their hearts are so wicked and they don't truly believe. They don't truly have faith. So he kind of switches it up here. He says when he... he sorry. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house, which I came. So notice how would an uh, evil spirit, evil spirit won't just leave. Obviously, it would be cast out. Because we see in the context a little bit ago, they're like, oh, he's casting out demons by the prince of demons. So Christ kind of came back to it. But in a way, he's coming back to it. He's showing them their hypocrisy. He's showing them that they don't truly understand because they're looking and thinking with the physical eyes, physical mind, physical heart. Instead of that Christ-like mindset, instead of spiritual. Because it's all by faith. And he says... I will return to my house in which I come from. He finds it empty, swept, clean, and put in order. So the context here and the idea here is that it's been cast out. So that's why it's so important to put that house, to put that house occupied by the Holy Spirit. And this is why I think Christ kind of led it into this way. He's saying the men of Nineveh is going to stand up and, and judge you and it's going to come back to you because they repented. The queen of the south, it's going to come back to you because she believed by faith in what was given to her. But yet still what's been given to these religious Pharisees, these scribes, yet they still can't see. Yes, they still don't believe. It's all going to come back to you. And this is where he's tying it in the spiritual because there's something wrong with the heart. Just like he says, make the tree good and its fruits good. So he's kind of leaving it as an open invitation that even though their hearts are wicked, even though they can't understand, even though they stand against him, it's almost like, you know, it's I'm, I'm still here. All you have to do is just believe. You know, you could understand if you just if you just believed with your heart. It's what it is. But I refer he's referring to his wicked spirits in them. They can't see, they can't understand. But now it's by God, now by Christ, we can have it occupied. This is why I believe he came back to it. Because he, I believe, he, as we're going to get into, is to love our enemies. These are enemies of Christ. Because he died for his enemies. Those who stand against Christ, those who stand against the gospel, his word, what he came to do, obviously are an enemy to him, but he loves his enemies. He died for all. So when he goes back to it here and he says, an evil spirit goes out of a man and when it comes back... It finds it clean, swept in order. That's why we need to occupy it. I believe Christ was leaving this as an open opportunity for them to accept him. Just like what we see right up here in the context where they say, you know, you cast out Satan by uh, the prince of Satan, by the prince of demons. And when he says, uh, make it right here in verse 33, make a tree good and its fruits good. And then when he goes right here after calling out their hypocrisy, saying that, you know, the men of Nineveh repented, the queen of the south believed, now he's leaving this as an open invitation for them to accept him. Make the tree good and its fruit will be good. An evil spirit goes out of a man and then it'll come back, so occupy it. They're not truly understanding because they don't have spiritual eyes. They don't have a, a Christ-like heart. They don't believe. But they could never say, oh, he never did this. He never offered it. The entire time he was doing this, showing their hypocrisy, he was showing love. He was showing mercy, saying, just come to me. You can stand there, attack, stand there, and try and use the same scriptures that Christ wrote against him, only for it to not work. You can have all these signs. You can have all the scriptures fulfilled. 
you can try and condemn it won't work, but yet the Savior is still standing there with arms wide open. You know, still giving him an invitation. Just believe, you know. It says, then he says, I will return to my house, which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, put in order. This is why it's, it's so important to have your house occupied. And this is what Christ is saying. You know, he's leaving as an invitation. But have it to where there's no vacancy. You know, the devil comes and tries to get in. All the doors, all the windows are blocked in because the door that God opens, no man can shut. And the door that God shuts, no man can open. And it, no, they wouldn't be able to get in. You occupy your soul. You occupy your heart with the Son of God, Christ, the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you. And the devil cannot get in. And he goes to knock and boom, he opens the door. And guess who's standing there? Christ. And he flees. He can't come in. There's no way. Already occupied, there's no vacancy. So he says, then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it be with this wicked generation. And this is kind of what I was saying to like uh, before, is it's almost worse because it's like as time goes by, as it continues to go, it gets worse and worse and worse. They have no excuse. Look at all the signs they have to begin with, but look at the end time Bible prophecy signs. And it's just going to become more and more clear and more clear and more clear. And the more they wait, the more they wait, the more they wait, the more they wait, it's going to be worse. And that's why God's trying to wake them up, trying to show them, hi, hello. Occupy your house, occupy your body, your soul with the Spirit of God. Because not only when it comes down to death, salvation through the blood of Christ alone, look at what could happen. You're leaving yourself vulnerable to have your house occupied. If your house is not occupied with the Spirit of God, and it, there's either no vacancy or there's the enemy living in there or it's occupied by someone you don't want to. And this is why Christ is referring to him when he draws it perfectly uh, with physical, referring to them using the, the Old Testament, using what they would know, using the physical, but also drawing that line showing how it's now spiritual, giving them the out, giving them the open to accept him. Your house is empty or your house has a, a, a wicked spirit. Well, vacant, um, occupy it now. Make it to where there's no vacancy. Put the Son of God inside of you. Accept him, which is what he's saying here and he's saying to us. So that way nobody will be able to come in. No wicked spirit, no influence, no nothing. It's already occupied by the Son of God. Because he's going to come back if he gets cast out. Well, he doesn't find any rest anywhere. So he's going to come back to what he knows. And that's why if people get the, you know, the demons cast out of them. And uh, that's why it's just so important that, you know... They, it's not just left that they, they give their life to Christ. They have to understand why that has happened. Obviously, it goes by the will of God, how God wants it, how God distributes it in certain situations. You know, they have to be willing. Some people want that. Some people bring them on. Other people don't. Other people are bound, tied. You see the the two men that were bound walking around tombs. I mean, half the town just stayed away from them because they were so violent. But they approached Christ. They came to Christ. So that's the idea too is, is let alone from our house not being occupied or, or not being vacant. One who gets a demon cast out of him in this context. Christ is saying, man, that demon's going to come back and be, that demon's going to be like, hey guys, guys, I found someone. They cast me out, but they didn't give their life to Christ. It's clean. It's all put in order and no one's in there. Let's go back in. Guys, check it out. That's what he's saying here. So besides if there's a demon or not, we need to vacant, uh, we need to occupy our house, our soul with the uh, blood of Christ, with Christ himself, the Holy Spirit. But also in this time, in this context where demons were being cast out, the context is Christ just cast out a demon. He's using this time, this example, to now occupy that house with the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, which Christ is using every example of the context for them as an invitation for them, for us and what we read today, for anybody that ever reads it, and for that moment in time for that man right there. It's so amazing. It's so crazy how God works. And there's more and more and more and more and more that our carnal mind can't even understand. And there's going to be something new more and more every single time we read it. But he says, so it shall be with this wicked generation. That's why it's so important. we got to occupy 
our house. We got to we got to invite the Holy Spirit in so that the enemy will not break in because that's the difference. The Lord's not going to break in and not going to force himself in. The enemy will. The enemy looks for any nook, any cranny that he can get into and when he's in, oh he's in. But not the son. The son just patiently waits out waiting to be invited in and when you open that door, it's open by him. He now controls it. It's now in him. He's the one who opens it. He's the one who shuts it. You're good. You have the Holy Spirit. And that's what it's about. That's what he's saying. And that's the difference. It's not by violence. It's not by force. It's not by sneaking in. It's not by theft. It's by invite. And when he's in, there's nothing else the enemy can do. Every single thing the enemy tries, he'll get so tired of trying to break in that he'll just wait for you. Instead of trying to get into you, he'll just wait for you to try and make a step. And that's kind of what's what I've noticed too and what I've noticed in people's life is, is how the enemy works and how he tries to get in. But when he can't get in, he'll stand on the outside and he'll try and get you to come to him. He'll try and get you. When there's no other way for him to get in, he's looking for you to make a way in for him. And you can't do that if you have Christ. If you're focused on Christ, your heart's on Christ, the Holy Spirit, he can try and faint bang on the house you can try and get it and try and break it it won't work so that's why it's just so important we got to occupy our house no vacancy it says while he was still talking to the multitudes behold his mother and brother stood outside seeking to speak with him and this is also christ showing too um that it's the spirit it's not by the holy spirit in context the holy spirit here and they said, then one of them said, look, I would, would imagine this is one of the Pharisees and the scribes. One of them said to him, look, your mother and your brother are standing outside seeking to speak with you. And he answered and said, the one who told him, who's my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hands. He stretched out his hands towards his disciples. And he said, here are my mothers and here are my brothers. And he says, for whoever does the will of my father who is in heaven is my brother, my sister, and my mother. There's no gender, no race. It's brother, sister, mother, because this is the spirit of God. That's the context. He's, he's showing them and using this uh, for them, for his disciples, for us, that it's now that, that new covenant in him, the new uh, Holy Spirit. Our house can be occupied. We can make the tree good by the Holy Spirit, by him. That it's no longer physical, it's not a flesh, what the world sees, oh, well, you know, those are your brothers, those are your sisters, those are your mothers. No, that's by law, that's by flesh. No, it's by the Spirit. It's by the Holy Spirit. These, my disciples, he stretched out his hands towards his disciples, his disciples or followers of Christ. Those who believed in him, those who did the will of the Father, because they were sons. Granted, there was, granted the, the ghost hadn't been given up to him, but God already knew, God already had plans. The Spirit was upon them. It might not have been actually in them, but it was definitely upon them. And God already knew that they were going to belong to him. God just had plans, had will. It hadn't been done yet. But he stretched out his hands just like when he was on a cross. And he looked at John and he said, Mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. He stretched out his arms because he's showing us. He's showing us his true love, his true mercy, true uh, forgiveness of God coming in the flesh. But now by the Holy Spirit, that's the context of it. It doesn't matter persecution, what they try and do, try and kill him. He's still standing there with arms wide open saying, come to me. He's giving them an invitation. They just can't understand it because their heart's wicked. And that's what's so crazy. I want you to think about that too. It doesn't matter what we've done. It doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter how many times we persecuted, hated Christ. He's still standing there saying, come to me. Occupy your house. Believe in me. Because he's true love. He is love. That's what he is. He's love. And he proves it time and time again. He says, whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. Because that's the Holy Spirit. It's one and all. And it's so amazing. It's so powerful because he calls us friends and this is why we're not a part of the world or we're not of the world we're just in the world passing by and and that we're of the body of christ we're the family of christ your sons and daughters of god by the spirit of adoption by the holy spirit this is what he's saying you know make that tree good occupy the house believe repent 
and that's the Holy Spirit. You do the you do the will of the Father. You believe because that is the will of the Father. Let's go real quick. Let's go Matthew. Just go back one quick. Matthew chapter seven verse twenty one. A couple verses here. It says, okay. Verse 20, therefore by their fruits you will know them, but not everyone who says to me, that's what he says. So this is also Christ claiming that he's God, showing that he's God. Not everyone who says to me, not me, just using this as the context of Christ saying this, Lord, Lord shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father in heaven. So let's go to 1 John chapter 3 real quick. Okay, so getting the context right here, it says, starting in verse 21, it says, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. And this is His commandment. So whose commandment is it? It's God's commandment. Why? It says that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ. So we know that this is God's commandment. And this is God's will that we would believe on the name of, of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. And He gave us commandment. As He gave us commandment. It says, now who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. And this is, and by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Because that's the context, it's the spirit, it's the commandment to believe. And what's interesting about 1 John chapter 3, was John's written to Pharisees. John's written to false prophets and false religious uh, Pharisees. And, you know, people say it, it's arguably, it can be argued too, because I want you to see something. When we go to 1 John chapter 1, it's very similar to John. It says right here, we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. So when we go to actual John the Apostle, which this could be John the Apostle too, it's argued. I personally don't think it is. I think it's John the Baptist, but it can be argued. John the Apostle, because the way John... In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So it's very similar. So it arguably could be John the Baptist, or John the Apostle. But what I want you to see something, when we get Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, how it's written out, we get the first hand. So there was a, sand, a man sent from God whose name was John. So the way John's writing, uh, John, when he's talking about John the Baptist, he's writing it as it's not himself. Because he says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. That's John the Baptist. But John is writing it as John the Apostle. And we get this first hand when we look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Because the context, make the way straight for the Lord. One of the voice crying in the wilderness. That's John the Baptist. But what we see when we go through John, you're, we're getting first hand accounts of Christ. A woman in Samaria came to Jesus. John the Baptist wasn't there walking with Christ. Um, John the Apostle was. So when we look at John, I believe this obviously John the Apostle, we get first-hand accounts of Christ. But I want you to think of something when we go to 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. It's almost like he tied this into Old Testament. And this is why I believe, I mean, it's, it could be argued, you know, this could be John the Apostle. Because they'll say this is John the Evangelist. Well, John the Baptist was an evangelist and so was John the Apostle. But look at how he writes this, though. It says, And life was manifest, and seeing you bear witness and declare to you that you have eternal life. It says, Fellowship with the Father and His Son, Jesus. The way he writes it out, it's almost like he, he's writing it as not referring to law, how it used to be in law, but now by faith through Jesus Christ. So it's almost perfect for John the Baptist, the way it's written out. It says, If we walk by light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And it's by the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses, cleanses us from all sins. Sin, sin, sin. Sin, what cleanses us? Uh, blood of Christ. See, we see sin, sin, sins, forgiveness. So it's almost kind of like uh, 
a, a Baptist, if you would, because that's what John was doing. He was baptizing, wash, uh, washing away, uh, making that public statement uh, for, uh, for their faith in, in God. And this is why I believe it's John the Baptist is everything that we see here written in. It's almost like it's lined up perfectly so that, okay, my little children, these things are right to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, because that's someone they would go to John the Baptist for. It says he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not of ours only, but also for the whole world. The way he, the writer here is writing it is almost as if he's a Baptist. It says, Because I write to you, your sins are forgiven for your namesake. Okay, I have written to your father. To, so to your, I have written to you, fathers. So it's almost like, because it, the way it's written, written to false prophets, written to false Pharisees, the way he's referring to it, it's almost like he's referring to the Jews directly. But also what I want you to think about too is John the Baptist being um, obviously by law because Christ hadn't come yet. But we see how it's written out. See how it's written out. It's like John took everything that was Old Testament and lined it up by the blood of Christ, lined it up by faith. So whether it's John the Baptist or John the Apostle, it's just so amazing. It's so amazing. And one of my favorite verses, let's go here real quick. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. Belo starting verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God, and he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So you see the way Christ, Christ referred this to almost John, even though John hadn't been written yet. This is amazing. This is, this is how God works, because everything of the Scripture is God-breathed. So when this was going on, this hadn't been written yet, but God already knew it. Christ already knew it. So when we go back real quick, oh, sorry, we go back real quick to Matthew chapter 12, when he says, and stretched out his hand towards his disciples, here's my mother, here's my brothers, for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my mother, my brother, and my sister. Uh, my brother, my sister, and my mother. So that's to to believe upon the Son and, and to, to, to love the Lord God, obviously, with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength, to love your neighbor as yourself. But look at how, how Christ tied this in. Because you take the repentance. The way John has written, it's written to people who already had the idea of repentance. You take Matthew here in this context, these religious Pharisees, these Jews already had the idea of repentance. When you take the Gentiles, if we truly believe we'll repent, it's not by an act of work. It's just by an act of in the heart, change of mind. But it's by belief. But the way Christ ties this out, and when we go to John, which hadn't been written yet, it lines up perfectly because you know it comes from God. And I just kind of realized that too. Oh, whoops, sorry. Because the context we get into is by this, you know, the spirit of God, every spirit, that's the context, the Holy Spirit. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come from the flesh of God and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming. And this is what we're seeing in Matthew. Christ is showing them how it's divided. Uh, he's showing them it's by the spirit of God. These are the ones who do, do the will, or my brothers and sisters, by the spirit of adoption. But John hadn't, this hadn't been written yet. And this is how perfect God is. This is awesome. It says, You are of God, little children. You have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he is who in the world. It says they are of the world, therefore they speak as the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, because that's the will of God we see in Matthew seven twenty one, to love the Lord God, to love each other, is to do the will of the Father. It all lines up. It's all perfect. This is the scripture. It's so amazing. 
It says, Beloved, let us one love one another, for love is of love is of God, and every one who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So we have an actual standard definition of what love is, and love hung on a cross for us, took our sin, took our consequences, our shame, separated from the Father, took a physical beating, took the spiritual beating, took all of our cares, anxieties, pains, took the wrath of God, and yet still shows love. That's a true definition of what love is. It's everything that we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is patient, love is kind, never self-seeking, never self-boasting, keeps no record of right and wrong. Christ came down to serve, not to be served. He says if we give him our sins, he washes us white as snow. He doesn't even remember it because he's a true definition of love. We have a true definition of what love is. And we see this time and time again. Because even though Christ, even though I want to say, oh yeah, well Christ is just standing there pointing out their hypocrisy. Yes, he's standing there pointing out their hypocrisy. But understand, he's still standing there with arms wide open, giving them the invitation to accept him and believe. So... It's just so amazing. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother, my sister, and my mother. It's because you've been born of the Holy Spirit of God. It's so amazing. And that's the spirit that's inside of you. So, right on. Lord Jesus, I just thank you so much for this time, Father. Thank you for this time in the scripture together. Holy Spirit, thank you for making it clear, making it understandable. I just pray that it uh, marinates and resonates on our heart, Lord, that you just continue to speak to us throughout the day and that we just remember it, Lord, that it's on the heart, it's on the soul, not by the carnal mind, not by the flesh, but that it's remembered in the soul and that it's it, it's food, you know, it's something that we can take because it's your word, Lord, it's your word. It's what we live off of, it's what we go to, it's what we love. It's so amazing. Thank you for the opportunity and the privilege that we have just to have your word, to be together, to read your word, to know you, to get to know you, to get to know each other, to get to know ourselves, to to have the to feed off of the true bread of life, which is you, Lord. You are the living word. And it's just so amazing, and I just thank you. Thank you for this time together, Lord. Thank you for your scriptures. Thank you so much, Lord Jesus. In your holy name I pray, amen. Right on, guys. Thank you for reading with me and being with me. I just wanted to finish up Matthew chapter 12, and then we'll get into Matthew chapter 13 here in just a day or two. Probably do a couple more things, and then we'll get into it. But yeah, we'll get right into Matthew chapter 13 in a couple days. So God bless you guys. Thank you for being with me. I hope you have a good rest of your day.